Hi everybody, this is Milton Moore with another presentation at Present Tense. This will be some tips on how you can improve your photography by changing the way you see the world through your viewfinder. Some of this is a matter of approach. It's a matter of how to look at a situation you want to photograph, more than just rules of composition. But first I want to give a shout out to the staff photographers at the day in New London, Connecticut, who agreed to let me use their fine work to illustrate many of these points. So thanks to Sean Elliott, to Tim Cook, Tim Martin, and Dana Jensen. Okay, let's dig in. Good composition is not an end-all and be-all. It's much like good spelling and good grammar are for reporters. Composition can be crucial to getting your point across, but it is not the point. The point is the content. The great street shooter Gary Winogrand said, the world looks different when you put four corners on it, and it's a big world to fit in a small frame. And that's what you're doing with your camera, fitting a scene into a rectangle. To do this, you can't be passive. You have to move, you have to be a visual explorer and a hunter. So here we go. We'll look at some basic concepts and how you can use them. We'll start at the beginning. My first camera, my first bad picture. This shot of my friend Jeff is a classic. He's too far away. The focal area is directly on his forehead like the crosshairs of a gun sight. We've all seen these. But the issue, what is this photo about? What's the subject? That little guy there? So we get closer and it starts improving. You have to do the thinking for the viewer. What is this photo about? Aha! It's a portrait of Jeff. Mystery solved. That's your job using composition. Defining the subject and making the content you want most to convey to be clear at a glance. In this tutorial, we will look at the rule of thirds, the role of diagonals in a composition, how to build depth into an image, how to use lines to lead the eye, the importance of simplifying the image, and the value of using a high or a low angle. We'll start with the most basic concept of composition, the rule of thirds. This grid should look familiar, since most applications and most cameras include it in their framing or cropping tools. You see three horizontal lines and three vertical lines that chop the image into thirds on both axes. The basic idea is that the key part of your image should be on one of these four intersections. Now it's not that technical, it's not that specific. It's really about avoiding centering the subject. But we'll look at some examples and see how pictures become more successful by fitting this basic matrix. Much of this is just intuitive. We need to show the man. We need to show his flooded yard. We need to show his flooded cars. We need space for that. But we apply the grid and we see the rule of thirds. Or the soldier is departing and he's hugging his brother. But we want to show the car and the crying mother because they're also narrative elements. And there's the rule of thirds. Or we go to Veterans Day. We get the old vet and the flag, another classic image. And the vet is on the rule of thirds line. We go to a science class. And here's the kid doing her experiment. Nice close-up tight shot. But we need to show that it's in a class. Rule of thirds provides space for that context. It's so much a part of our visual language that it works on almost any type of photo, even a studio portrait. But why does it work? Well, the composition seems more natural and less contrived. 
It's more dynamic to not center the subject in the box where it's trapped. It naturally provides space for context for the world that that subject inhabits. And symmetry is static. It looks forced, it looks man-made. Really, it's the most boring compositional technique. But basically, rule of thirds is what people respond to. It's like music. People don't like atonal music, they like tonal music. And rule of thirds simply works. Next, we'll look at using diagonal lines to slash across the four corners of the box. Diagonals are rebellious. Like rule of thirds, they push back against being trapped. They create a visual motion as they cut across the grid. Our cities are full of elements we can use to create this motion, and the diagonal line is a very strong implication of motion. Even in a static scene, when you see a strong diagonal, think about how it can help your composition. Look for it and use it when you can. Next, a really crucial tool, building depth into your images. You can add that third dimension to your two-dimensional picture plane through your ability to control the composition. So, here's a, a glacier. It's over there on a mountainside, and it looks big, probably, but it's over there. Once you use foreground, you give the viewer a point of orientation. Foreground actually lets your viewer enter the scene. It gives them a place to step into. Using foreground, particularly with people in it, is much more involving for the viewer. Just a long shot of the canyon, it doesn't really attract you the way being there with the people attracts you. Even the backs of heads, something we're always told to avoid, can be useful if they help create depth and context. And foreground has a particularly strong effect on long shots like landscapes. This one is a nice graphic image, foggy day, we like it. But it becomes a different image when foreground is included to add depth. There's no right or wrong here, but as a photographer, you should vary your approach, particularly on a static scene, to see what best fulfills your vision. Next. We already talked about diagonal lines, and here's a variation on that theme. Lines that lead the eye. Lines can carry the eye into the frame or to the subject. This shot here is also a good example of letting the subject break out of the box, that rebellious subject that, that breaks out of the linear trap. When you see a scene with good lines, be like Cartier-Bresson and wait for some actors to take the stage. I wish that for this shot I took in Moscow, the kissing couple had been closer, but I waited and waited. Tim Cook did a great job of framing this shot. Rule of thirds on the subject, a strong line leading to him, a calm scene that is visually energized by a good composition. And in this great shot by Sean Elliott, the motion is reinforced by the strong shadows that create a line connecting the father and child. Was this planned? I doubt it. But the composition speaks for itself. Next up, another key to making a good photo. Simplifying the image. As it becomes more of a graphic, it gains impact. There are no distractions when the image is uncluttered. A clean background almost always accomplishes this for you. You don't have to see the whole steer to get the story. The tag on his ear, we're in a farm, we're raising beef. Dana Jensen went out to shoot a belly dancing class and came back with this fabulous image. 
we don't need to see the whole belly dancer. We've got a belly, we've got the motion, there's the story. When you simplify an image, the key element gets stronger. You're drawn to her eyes because there are so few distractions. And for this award-winning picture by Dana Jensen, all the details carry the story. The look on the girl's face, the two hands, the uniform. We get it. We know what's happening here by seeing just a small section of it. Now at the beginning I said photography is an active pursuit. It's physical. You ought to be moving around to visually explore a scene. And low angles have a strong impact. A low angle makes your subject seem monumental and important. This is particularly true with kids and small animals. Make them important. Don't look down on them. Let them stand with you. Photos give us the ability to see the world from a different angle. We all look out at the world at 5 foot 5 or 5 foot 2 or whatever elevation our eyes are at. So explore. Change that around. Help me see the world differently. And whether it's little kids or pets or berry pickers, get down there with your subject. Get into their world and try to truly capture it. This has a really nice use of foreground and leading lines, too, but all the elements add up. A high angle is a different point of view. It isn't as dramatic, but it solves the whole eye-level sameness issue and has other benefits. It's a scene we don't normally see. It puts the light source clearly on the subject and it cleans up a cluttered background. When you see a ladder or a balcony, check it out. I don't like heights myself, but I've scared myself silly in pursuit of photographs. So when you see that high spot to shoot from, take a look. The clean background created by this high angle accentuates Sean Elliott's rule of thirds composition. If you shot across at these fisher people, you would just see the barren trees on the other bank, not that good a framing element. And simply holding the camera over your head in what we call a Hail Mary shot changes the point of view and gives a bigger sense of the whole scene. So in closing, we saw six approaches to making good compositions. But rule of thirds should be your default. Just look for it and fall back on it. You can look for graphic elements like lines to help break up that rectangle that's trapping your world. You can try to pull out the key subject by simplifying your content. But most importantly, put on your running shoes because photography is a physical pursuit. You need to move to visually explore, to see what there is to see, and to bring back images that are far from ordinary. Thanks for being here today, and I hope you got something out of this.